life. 9% is not good enough. So do you look at 22 or 24 uh, of a premium food where you know that the quality of the ingredients is there? How, how do you do that? So it isn't that simple. By the time the clients see me, they are totally frustrated. They've changed diet so many times. They've gone on novel antigen diets. They've done it for a while. It's so expensive. So I said, let's start from the basics. Let's do either raw, a mixture of fresh raw foods, or the same fresh foods cooked, using recipes that have been confirmed by animal nutritionists, myself and others. And we start with that. And if the animal does much better, then we're on the right track. So then we try to find a, if, it, if it's inconvenient for them to keep cooking and cooking and cooking, and the dog's a Great Dane, for example, um, we find a cereal-based kibble that is gluten-free, that has very few ingredients that could be reactive, and then we add home cooking to that to make sure they get things like the tryptophan we want them to have and the omega-3 fatty acids. We under-supplement with fatty acids, so we have to do more than we're currently doing. There is one commercial dog food currently on the market that may help dogs with fear-based aggression. I just heard recently there is a diet called Calm, made by Royal Cannon. And actually, they have told me, and I think they're going to come and see me, we base this on your research, and it does contain lower protein. The therapeutic use of Calm is not intended to treat aggression. For example, if you back a dog into a corner and it bites you, some may interpret the dog as being aggressive without understanding that they are reacting to a fearful situation in this manner. We know that the components of the diet that address the stress and anxiety have been researched not only in pets but in people. And we absolutely understand how uh, the components tryptophan, alpha casozapine, and vitamin B3, how they actually have almost a benzodiazepine um, uh, activity benzodiazepines being drugs like Valium, uh, and that we can use those to absolutely affect stress and anxiety in that pet, and we have good therapeutic trials to show that it works. So there are three components of the diet, and they've well, been well researched, and um, one of them is tryptophan. It's a great product, but it's only available for small dogs. I'd love to use it in big dogs, but the trouble is if I want to use it in a big dog, the people, you know, they better have a yacht in a mansion to be able to afford it in a, in a large size dog. And it comes in a very small bag, so it'd be very, it's very inconvenient. I wish they'd get it for the middle size and larger dogs. The, the factor is just in the cost. The alpha casozapine is a very in expensive ingredient, and to put it in at therapeutic levels for dogs greater than 15 kilograms uh, is just cost prohibitive at this point. So if that ingredient, if that nutrient changes in cost, then yes, it could go into the diet. Let's hope that day comes soon. Coming up, after a lot of legwork, this family finally finds some answers. Well, he's our child. Would you give a child up? No. Wouldn't. So we just force people into listening to us. He has no voice. Memphis was probably the best dog in the world. Um, it still is. <laughs> um, he was almost a, I guess called a, a Velcro dog, is what we refer to him as, because he would pretty much follow us everywhere. She'd be fine. You know, I'd be walking through my living room next to her, and all of a sudden, that would be it. Lunge, grab, drag, shake. A different look in his eyes as it was happening, and almost a, a, almost a real light switch that would flip on and off that quickly. That was another really awful incident where she had me really pinned down. Um, she bit me um, a couple of times. She uh, once I had like big red marks on my hand, and this is through a leather mitten, okay, a big chopper mitten. She had me, and another time I had a big bruise where she grabbed me. These incidents were pretty much, they were unprovoked. They just came out of nowhere. It was scary. It was very scary. And I was really getting to the point where I was afraid she was going to hurt somebody when we go out. This couple struggled for a year to convince their vet that there was something drastically wrong with Memphis. They were finally able to find a solution with Dr. Landsberg's help. After that particular event, it would have been a matter of, I guess, a matter of small seconds. Um, because he, it was almost, uh, 
I, I don't want to say a Jekyll and hyde kind of situation, but it was a, a, an outburst and then very apologetic seconds afterwards, just ears back and kiss his tail wagon trying to make up for what, what he obviously knew was, was wrong for him or was out of character. There wasn't anything identifiable before then. So based on the history and the owners, I saw a dog who clearly had something new, something that had recently arose. I could trust the owner's history, and I had to delve into it a little bit more to find out what might be truly going on. So once all the structural, uh, physical problems were ruled out, we still felt, and so did Don, and so did the neurologist, that it was a possibility that, that he had epilepsy, that he had a seizure focus in the brain of unknown origin. There's a term that's often used in behavior, not as a diagnostic term, as a descriptive term called rage. And rage is a very inappropriate term, but it still describes it in some ways, as long as you talk about the term in the way it's meant to be used. And that is that there are no obvious triggers to the behavior. It comes on suddenly and relatively explosively. The animal can't seem to have conscious control over its behaviors, that it's not usually related to an environmental insult or training or something the owners have done. And Memphis fit into that category of coming on suddenly, having a total change in his behavior, both with the event plus the follow-up behaviors. After several months, he was improved dramatically with the medication. They were quite pleased that we were on the right track. Just having Dr. Landsberg listen to us and give us an answer, we then knew that we could then start on some form of a, a place to go. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a relief. His personality has come back to probably 90, 90, 95% of what it was prior to the first incident. Rage turned out to be one of the causes of Molly's aggression. We were going with the fact that it might be dominance aggression, because she was kind of a teenager at the time. We put her on Prozac, that did absolutely no good. Mm. Okay, it didn't do a thing. And she um, continued being horrible. Shortly after, in January, I came to see you. When we had that original appointment, mm. I steered you in the direction of what is technically called complex partial seizures, right. which is otherwise known as rage. And you know, we know they get full-blown tonoclonic uh, seizures, mm -hmm. but there are partial seizures that can affect just one part of the brain. And if it affects a certain area in the so-called limbic system, the emotional brain, you can get um, a reaction which is uh, episodic, um, extreme, uh, apparently totally irrational, uh, no real stimulus, trivial or no stimulus, a ridiculously aggressive response, followed sometimes by calm after the storm. It's kind of relentless. Right. It's ongoing. Yes. It can last for several minutes or sometimes longer. And then when it's over, it's over and you get your dog back. Right. But you can't live like that. No. The seizures were not Molly's only issue. Two things correlated with low thyroid. One was aggression and the other was seizures. So I was thinking, well, Molly has both and she's also a large breed dog. Mm -hmm. So this is a good direction to go. So I checked her thyroid. It was low. Right. And we rectified that by giving the veterinary uh, version of thyroxin. Uh, we put her on to an anticonvulsant, right. uh, phenobarbital. I was so relieved, you know, to see that. that so we, we, it was we, remarkable. And the phenobarb we put on board, it got up to a decent level. Her behavior is completely under control. Right. And you now have a wonderful dog who's yep. your great companion and you have no fear. It would save a family their pet if they knew about that. You know, if, if they knew more about these seizures, uh, definitely your heartache would be less and you'd uh, feel confident that your pet was going to stay with you. If we could have gone to the back of the book and looked at the answer right away, yeah. um, it would have probably three, four months worth of bickering and arguing and stress and, as you say, the, the heartache that goes with it of not knowing. Um, and again, I don't know 
other folks' level of intensity as far as how they care for their pets. Um, but yeah, you say you just did really bothers you to think of how many were given up on right after the first week. Coming up, will nutrigenomics be the key to curing more cases of canine aggression? What if the real pro problem was aggression secondary to something else and you didn't know it? So you correct the food and then everything goes away. Right? How do we know the behavior isn't tied up somehow with some other pathophysiological change in the body that we've not identified? In the future, there may be some progress in terms of finding more links between canine nutrition and aggression. We've all heard the expression, you are what you eat. An exciting field of study might just make that the new reality. Nutrigenomics is linked to the concept that optimal nutrition can be designed based on an individual's unique genetic makeup or genotype. So nutrigenomics is, is a big term just talking about the effects of, of nutrition on DNA and RNA. So everybody has genes that are turned on and turned off during different activities, um, different disease conditions. And so nutrigenomics can look to see if nutrition can impact those genes and whether or not they're turned on or off, depending on the situation. Not surprisingly, Dr. Gene Dodds is one of the leaders in this exciting area. We asked Dr. Dodds if nutrigenomics may be a key to curing more cases of canine aggression. The technology is doing DNA RNA microarray, which is a, you know, like a genetic engineering map, so to speak, of the uh, genes that are going to be turned on and turned off. And you're looking at enzymes that those genes produce that are upregulated, positive, or downregulated, negative. And so you determine what the pattern profile is. And if you see, and, and usually those patterns are colored red if they're bad and green if they're good. Logical, right? So you have this array of all the enzymes in the body that are turned off or on, like cytokines and like uh, interleukins and whatever. So you want to make the more green than red. So you have to figure out which botanicals or foods will turn off the inflamed ones. Okay? And we know that. And you feed it for about 28 days, and you can do the map again, and you'll see most of the things are green. It's already been done for arthritis, obesity, liver disease, whatever. Um, we can do that. And we're, we have diets now that are promoting uh, good behavior, but they're generic, like the breed-specific diet. They're not going to necessarily work well enough for an individual. You start with that, and then meanwhile you're doing your microwave, and you say, oh, we have to add this particular botanical, or we have to add more turkey, or we have to take out something. And now this, for this animal, the food is balanced. The genes don't express aggression anymore. Pet companies have already been implementing findings from nutrigenomic studies in their pet food and agree that this will play a vital role in the future of pet foods. I think nutrigenomics and a lot of the omics fields like epigenetics and all these other really high-tech areas in science have the potential to change a lot of the human food as well as pet food, kind of tailoring it to specific needs. Um, so I, I think the landscape will change a lot, but I think at the end of the day we'll still have complete and balanced diets. I, I think there's all kinds of research going on, and when you look to the futurists in pet food, there is a great deal of interest in being even more precise uh, in the nutrition for a pet than we already are. Uh, you know, do, do you have that dream that someday you will look at the genetic makeup of an individual pet, the ancestry of that pet uh, that came from a miniature schnauzer versus a chihuahua versus some other dog, and then be actually able to sculpt a diet for that pet because of the genetic makeup of that individual? Uh, sounds like pie in the sky kind of science fiction, but we know that things are advancing so quickly, it's not that uh, out of the question. These things can happen. I think uh, in the future, we may be able to specifically individualize formulas for your very specific pet. And